So um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Pulkit. I am the program lead for charging infrastructure. And joining me today are my colleagues, uh, J.M. Toriel, uh, who works as a program coordinator, uh, Michael Stanier, uh, program lead for communications and outreach, and Madisa Raujo, uh, who is manager of sustainable transportation at Plugin VC. Um, so yeah, maybe we could just begin and people can uh, join as and when they come. So uh, you all know about Plugin VC, but I'll still give a, a background about our organization. So Plugin VC is a program of the Fraser Basin Council. Uh, it provides information and support around plug-in vehicles and charging infrastructure throughout British Columbia. And uh, before beginning the presentation, uh, I would like to acknowledge that uh, we design and work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sabertooth nations, which we call Vancouver today. Um, so today's webinar is being hosted to provide information about the program and the application process for the next funding review round. The application submission deadline date for which is the 2nd of June, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, before beginning the presentation, uh, I'd like to mention that if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, type them in the question and answer box as and when they come, and we'll try to address them through the presentation. I'll be answering all the questions at the end of the presentation as well when we'll open the room for question and answers. So this is the, uh, the, the agenda for the webinar today. We'll, be, uh, we'll begin with an introduction to the program, followed by going over the revised or updated program requirements. Uh, I would like to pause here and mention that the new program guide is available on the program website. A link for it will also be available in the chat. Uh, the new program guide is dated April 1st, 2023. Uh, so please refer to the new guide of, uh, for this review round and onwards. So continuing with the agenda, uh, we'll then go over the rebates offered under this program. After this, I'll delve into details on some very important components of the program, including scoring preferences, uh, the site design, uh, financial plan or the UNM calculator, cost and budget expectations, and some others. And finally, I'll be summarizing the application process and listing out the documents that are required for pre-approval. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be opening the room for question and answer session. Um, yeah, so next slide. So uh, this is, uh, this program is called the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger Program. And it is intended to increase the number of public diet current fast chargers throughout British Columbia to support the growing number of ZEVs, that is zero emission vehicles on the road. So uh, the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger Program is currently prioritizing applications for projects that fulfill geographic gaps and that are located, or that are located in rural, northern and indigenous communities. Uh, I'd like to also mention that applications in urban communities with high zero emission vehicle uptake, high concentration of multi-unit residential buildings and other rationale for requiring more fast charging will also be considered, though the applicants are encouraged to provide a detailed reasoning in the applications in those types of sites. For information on geographic gaps, please refer to the British Columbia Public Light Duty Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Study, the link for which is available on the program website as well. So the program is funded by the Ministry of Energy, Mines, and Low Carbon Innovation of the province of British Columbia and is administered by Fraser Basin Council, that is Plugin BC. So we do an eligibility check of the applications that come in and the final decision as to who would get uh, awarded, uh, who would get pre-approved and awarded the funding finally lies with the province of British Columbia. Here in this presentation, uh, we have highlighted a few very important points of the program. So the first one being that the program incentivizes level three direct current fast chargers and level two stations for use by the general public. Second, and one of the most important and basic requirements of this program is uh, 
the installation site requirement and the equipment requirement, uh, the, the installation site and the equipment should be publicly accessible 24 hours per day and 365 days per year. That is, it should be open to all and should not be restricted to any development. Uh, third uh, is that it is a pre-approval based program. Applicants must apply and be pre-approved for the program rebates before any costs are incurred. Additionally, any costs incurred before approval will not be eligible for rebates. Uh, I'll be going over the applicant eligibility criteria now. So uh, to be eligible to participate uh, in this program, uh, uh, it, the applicant must be a business, a not-for-profit, local government, indigenous community, utility, or public sector organization located and operating in BC, excluding core government entities, that is provincial ministries, but including non-core entities, example, utilities, health authorities, school districts, universities, crown corporations, etc. The next point in uh, under applicant eligibility criteria is uh, the applicant should be the current owner of the site or have approval in writing from the site owner to install the charging infrastructure for a minimum of 10 year period. And finally, I'd like to mention that for comprehensive information on eligibility requirements for this program, please refer to the program guide. Uh, now we'll be going over uh, the new additions or the updates that have been made to the program guide section wise. So the first edition has been made to section 2.2, that is installation site requirements. Site dimension requirements for pull through sites have been added to the section. Uh, so if you're planning to have pull through parking uh, bays, uh, then the dimensions for the parking bay should not be less than 3.9 meters wide. And the charging cable must be able to charge vehicles positioned at at least 1.5 meters away. The next uh, requirement has been added. Uh, the next addition is to section 2.3, that is equipment requirements. So the first addition has been made under section, uh, under uh, level two equipment requirements. So the level two stations now need to be network and be OCPP compatible, that is open charge point, point protocol compatible by the date of installation. We also have a new level three equipment requirement. Uh, so uh, that is as follows. So removal of the child demo requirement with the exceptions of the sites that are not within 50 kilometers of another child demo connector. So the uh, eligibility requirement reads as follows. Have a minimum of one child demo plug connector per site only if the charging site is located more than 50 kilometers of uh, more than 50 kilometers driving distance from the nearest public child demo DCFC. The distance to the nearest DCFC with the Chadamo plug will be determined using plugshare.com. Another addition to the equipment requirement is that if a payment is required to use the EV charging station, the charging station must provide a contactless payment method on site that accepts major credit cards and debit cards. Payment must also be accepted through either an automated toll free phone number or message or messaging system, uh, an SMS that provides the EV charging customer with the option to initiate a charging session and submit payment. Payment methods must be accessible to persons with disabilities and not affect the power flow to the vehicles. And payment methods that require membership or app login are permitted as long as payment methods uh, under, sec under point one and two noted above are also offered. So the next edition uh, of an eligibility requirement is under section 2.4. So canopies are now eligible as an elig uh, are now have now been added to the eligible project cost. So a canopy, I define it as a shed that goes over uh, a charging station to protect it from extreme weather conditions. So uh, yes, you can claim up to a maximum of twenty thousand dollars per application for a canopy. But the charge amount, the maximum amounts would remain the same. So I'll be going over the rebate amounts in the next few slides. Uh, going back to the program requirements, the new program requirements. Uh, so another program requirement 
Uh, so uh, there's new addition to uh, the pilot project section as well. Earlier, rebates were not specified for the pilot projects. Now these have been specified by the province. So now the rebates for pilot projects range from $5,000 for a level two charging station up to $130,000 for level three EV chargers with higher rebate amounts available for indigenous communities. So uh, now we'd be going over the rebate amounts that are available through this program. So uh, there are diff different rebate amounts available for non-indigenous and indigenous communities. There are three rebate, uh, there are three main power output categories uh, and there are different rebate amounts uh, offered under each category. So the first one is greater than or equal to a 20 kilowatts up to a 50 kilowatts. Great. The second one is greater than or equal to 50 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts. And the third one is greater than or equal to 100 kilowatts. These are for the level three chargers. So you could look at the rebate amounts that are offered under each of the categories for different communities. For the indigenous communities, uh, the percentage, uh, for non-indigenous communities, I'm sorry, uh, for non-indigenous communities, the percentage cap mentioned here, that is 50% of the project cost would increase to a 75% if you install more than one charger. That is, if you have tandem installation, this 50% would go up to a 75% of the project cost up to the maximum amount that is stated here. So I'd be explaining tandem installations in detail in the subsequent slide. Uh, the percentage cap always remains the same for indigenous communities, that is 90%. And the program guide defines an indigenous community as a first nation, that is a banned government or its wholly owned subsidiaries, example, development corporations. There are rebate amounts available for level two charging equipment as well. So uh, it is 50% of the cost up to $5,000 per station uh, for level two charges for non-indigenous communities. For indigenous communities, it's 90% or up to $7,500 per station. So for level two chargers, uh, I'd also like to mention that for non-indigenous communities, it maxes out at a $10,000. And for, not, for indigenous communities, it maxes out at a $15,000. So uh, like I explained in the previous slide, in addition to the power output of the EV charging station, there are other factors that influence the rebate amount that you would be getting for your project. These include the capability of the EV charging station to charge vehicles simultaneously. So multiport DCFCs are eligible for one rebate for each vehicle that can charge simultaneously at a given output level. The funding amount for multiport stations will be based on the maximum simultaneous output level of the operating ports. The next, require, the next one here is tandem installation. That is if you have two or more chargers on the site and I'll be explaining them on the next slide. So tandem installation is also one of the eligibility requirements. So uh, if a prospective installation location is greater than 500 meters from the nearest public charger, be it a level two or a DCFC, the project will be required to install at least two ports per site, that is either tandem DCFC stations, a DCFC and a level two, or two level twos as well, if you meet the conditions of standalone level two project mentioned under section 3.2.1. I'll be going over the standalone level two requirements in the presentation as well. The tandem installation requirement exists to provide redundancy to the site so that if one station breaks down, you still have another station that is working on the site. A multiport station on its own does not fulfill this requirement. You need to have more than one station. A dual port station alone would not fulfill this requirement. Like I explained earlier on the rebate amount slide for tandem DCFC stations, a 75% funding limit will apply while the combined dollar cap will remain the same. This is for non-Indigenous communities. Okay, so the next is level two only location. Um, so this program is intended to primarily support public fast charging. However, public level two stations not required to be co-located with a DCSC station will be supported only in specific instances. So I'd be going over a few uh, eligibility requirements for level two only stations. Uh, for comprehensive information, again, I'll uh, refer, I'll, I'll ask people to refer to the program guide. 
So the first requirement here is no public level two stations without co-located with DCFCs are eligible in Metro Vancouver Regional District and Capital Regional District through this program, except for any Gulf Islands with one or fewer public charging stations or for indigenous owned stations. The next is there must be one or fewer uh, public level two or DCFC within 10 kilometers of this location to be eligible for standalone level two projects. There's also a list of priority districts given for standalone level two uh, charging projects that could be found under section 3.2.1 of the program guide. So please refer to that list uh, to find if your district is one of the prioritized districts for level two, uh, standalone level two charging station. Now we'll be going over some important components of uh, this program. The first one is coding preferences. So after the deadline date, uh, that is once we have all your applications, we'll be scoring them based on certain parameters. Um, and uh, the preference will be given to the applications that number one, fill existing DCFC network gaps or underserved areas, example, indigenous communities, rural and Northern areas. So for, uh, like I mentioned earlier, for uh, looking at geographic gaps, you could refer to BC Public Light Duty ZDV Infrastructure Study, uh, and that's available on our program website. The next point is uh, preference would be given to uh, projects if they are co-located with uh, if they if the stations are co-located with primary amenities, including lighting, washrooms, Wi-Fi at all times. Preference would be given if the stations are co uh, if uh, if there is co-location with one or more additional DCFCs. If uh, the next point is if the stations are uh, located near secondary amenities such as restaurants, shopping. Uh, and attractions, example, parks, library, community centers, etc. Uh, if you include stations of greater than 75 kilowatts when they're located when when your project site is located on primary and secondary highways, uh, where feasible. Preference would be given if you include stations uh, which are able to deliver greater than or equal to 120 amperes of electricity if proposing DCFCs with output of greater than or equal to 50 kilowatts, but less than 100 kilowatts. If you include level two stations with a higher output uh, than 32 amperes, if level two stations are being proposed. Um, it, preference would be given if you utilize pull through charger side design. Preference would also be given if you include capability to add DCFCs in the future, for example, space on site, oversized conduits, etc. Uh, preference would also be given if you agree to provide data on charger usage, include site design drawings, and include an operations and maintenance plan as a part of your pre-approval application. So I'll be going over the financial plan and the site design in detail in the, uh, in the subsequent slides of this presentation. So uh, the first is site design. So site design is an optional document to submit, but it is highly recommended. That you, uh, that you submitted as a part of your pre-approval application. So it provides us an idea about the location of the EV chargers on the proposed project site. You could also demarcate the location of the electrical room and other electrical infrastructure available on site that would be supporting your proposed chargers. You could demarcate the location of the primary and sec secondary amenities on the site as well. So another important aspect of the site design is to roughly depict that the site is accessible 24 by seven all around the year. For, uh, for site design support, you should refer to EV fast charging design and operation guidelines for public DCFC stations by BC Hydro. It is available on the program website as well. So uh, the next day is a financial plan or an ONM calculator. So it provides you, the applicant, with a better idea of operations and maintenance costs associated with EV charging stations. Starting this round, a submission of a financial plan and ONM or an ONM calculator has been made mandatory. It's compulsory for you to submit it as a part of your, of your pre-approval application. So a financial plan should account for all the major costs including but not limited to electricity, uh, including energy and demand charges. 
service stability measures, including maintenance costs, repairs, servicing, and insurance, network, uh, network fees, and other costs. If revenues are collected, please describe the pricing model and method of collection. Uh, there is also an ONM calculator spreadsheet template available on the program website that you could refer to. So the next is budget quotation requirements. Uh, as a part of your application, you would be uploading a budget of your proposed project. This would include costs associated with purchase and installation of EV chargers. We use the budget provided in the application to calculate the rebate amount that would be set aside if the project is approved for rebates. The budget should be as itemized as possible. This is because only eligible costs would be counted towards rebates. Some costs eligible for uh, rebates includes DCFC or level two, uh, level two equipment costs, installation costs, including labor and material, which include earthwork, paving of one parking space per charger, uh, protective bollards around chargers and others. For a complete list of eligible project cost, please refer to section 2.4 of the program guide. Now I'll be summarizing the steps an applicant goes through while applying or participating in the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger program. The first step is to look at uh, the eligibility requirements. You can reach out to us through email if you have any questions about the eligibility requirements. We can also schedule one-on-one -on -one calls to uh, answer any questions or concerns you may have. Further, a recording of this webinar will also be posted online on our website after this webinar so, so that you can revisit the webinar as well. The next step is to apply for pre-approval. Uh, this would involve submitting an application online and you can uh, just go to our website and use the apply now button to submit your application. Uh, so the deadline date, I'd, uh, uh, I'll reiterate, is 2nd June 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. After we receive the application, the Ministry of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovations will be reviewing it. They will be announcing the results uh, uh, of all the applications, and we'll be reaching out to all the applicants respectively. A funding agreement will also be signed between successful applicant and Fraser Basin Council. This funding agreement will include the rebate amount calculated based on the budget. Uh, the applicant will be providing as a part of their application and also other factors such as the output of the charger. After the funding agreement is signed, the applicant gets 18 months to complete the project. After completing the project, the applicant will be submitting the final documentation to us. And after this, we'll be pro uh, providing them with the funding. So this is the complete application process, starting from understanding the program till completing your project and getting the rebates. Um, so next is the list of documents that are required for your pre-approval application. So the first one is the name of the organization along with the legal documentation. So the legal documentation could include documents such as uh, and, and, uh, the business incorporation certificate. Uh, you also have to mention the main contact of the, uh, of the application, that is who would be the beneficiary of the application uh, of the debates. The next is the address and features of the proposed installation site. The third one is written permission to use the site if the organization is not the owner. The fourth one is a proposed number, output, and model of the chargers. Fifth is budget quotation. And the next is operations and maintenance plan and a financial plan. So these are the required documentations that I've mentioned. Uh, there are optional documentation as well. Uh, which includes site design. I had mentioned that site design is recommended. Uh, and if you submit it, you'd score higher on your application. An EV charger specification sheet uh, of the proposed charges that, you'd, uh, that you are applying for for the rebates. And the last one is a backup location if you have any. So uh, this is about it from the presentation. 
Uh, finally, I'll mention that between now till the program deadline day, you can reach out to us on the following email ID that is publiccharger at pluginbc.ca for any clarifications and concerns. And we could also set up one-on-one -on -one calls uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and I'd also like to mention for comprehensive information, please visit our website, pluginbc.ca slash publiccharger. Uh, you could find information on rebates, eligibility criteria, application process, and the links for all the resources uh, related to this program. You'd also find uh, uh, frequently asked questions on our website. Now we'll be opening the room for question and answers. And uh, I would like to mention that we'll only be answering general questions about the program. You can reach out to us separately if you have any questions specific to your project site or your uh, instance. Um, yeah, we'll be happy to assist you. Thank you.